and this this is like one of the few times I would actually take into account like the time it takes to take off and put on yeah. armor. Yeah. Because full plate is takes a while to put on. There have been some people that literally paid twenty five thousand dollars to get like a five star gem, and for the record, you're the problem. <laughs> uh, sorry. Oh, great. Snowballs in Jaws now. Uh, mm -hmm. But, um, snow... Snowball... <laughs> Alex, um, are you experiencing any deja vu? I don't experience anything, Nathan. Uh, oh, that sounds like a very sad, boring life you have. <laughs> well, do podcasting. Exactly. Uh, hey everybody, welcome to uh, episode 39 of uh, Total Pebble Knockdown uh, again. My name is Nathan. <laughs> And I am apparently again still Alex. Yes. Uh, so for everyone out there listening, uh, this is actually the second time that we've recorded this episode because the first time the audio decided uh, it was stupid. And so <laughs> now that the audio is not so stupid, uh, we're, we're going to record it again, maybe even better than the first time. One can only hope. Well, at least quality wise, it will sound better. Oh, yeah, it will definitely sound better. We'll still be incoherent. So. Perfect. Just great. the way I like it. That's right. Well, we gotta stay on brand. So, uh, first up on the show, we are gonna do a Mechanically Speaking. And, uh, Alex, you already know what we're Mechanically Speaking about, but I'm sure you're excited anyway uh, <laughs> to find out. <laughs> um... So, uh, as you know, we have been playing a little uh, of the Dungeons and the Dragons, and, uh... No dragons have appeared yet. Well, Just we're, dungeons. We're getting there. I think. Maybe. Potentially. Okay. Anyways. The point is, uh, in the most recent quest that we went on, we ended up in a bit of a fight, a tussle of sorts, with some were-rats. Uh, a subject that we will probably talk about in another capacity on the next episode. But, uh, during that, our crew uh, had to figure out how they were going to fight these were-rats. And uh, as you probably got from that interaction, I was not very familiar as what, like, with lycanthropes in general and if they had strengths or weaknesses. Right. Um, none of you as players or characters were very familiar with lycanthropes or the like. Yeah. And uh, pr to be honest with you, I never really had a reason to understand <laughs> what, what they were until this very moment. And um, so a lot of our characters, though, are just dealing with common slashing and bludgeoning and piercing weapons. The bows and the swords and such and the daggers. And uh, oh, in my great club and your great club. Yeah, but, uh, essentially, yeah, most of you are martial classes. Yeah, uh, except for you as a bard who, again, you have a bit of spell casting that you can do damage and stuff with. But you're not like a wizard throwing fireballs. Right. Uh, not yet. That's not or, that's or not you're not a warlock. That's just using a cantrip to do D10 damage. Every attack. Every single time? Yeah, no, also not there yet. But um, the only things I really have for spell spells that were going to work uh, were like thunder spells, but I guess the thing is, is that once I started realizing that the slashing and everything wasn't working very well, my next thought was, oh, is thunder damage going to do much to them? And then I was thinking to myself, well, realistically, if they're rats... The only thing I can think that would probably really be bad for them is, like, fire. And yeah. there's there's a problem with that, as you probably know. The Bard spell list does not have a lot of fire spells involved. Yeah, because I had been explaining uh, when you guys attacked, I was letting you attack. I wasn't telling you they're immune to damage, but I was describing it as, um, so you hit, and, like, roll for damage, and, like, you hit it, and, like, your sword doesn't really cut into it. It doesn't feel like it's doing a lot of damage to them. Right. For right. Instance. Because yeah. uh, now we're aware that lycanthropes 
as rules written, have damage immunity to anything that is non-magical and non-silvered. Or, sorry, non-magical or non-silvered. It doesn't have to be both, just right. one or the other. Boy, if you had to find that specific weapon that was both of those things, that would have been something else. And honestly, most people are not going to think to have a silvered weapon unless they are specifically fighting lycanthropes. <laughs> or, or Faye. Uh, Faye might be cold iron, but, uh, one of the items you can actually buy that you can find sometimes, depending if it's in 5e, I think it is. I'm not sure if it's in the town you're in, but alchemical silver oh. can be found, which is like a bottle mm. that you basically coat a weapon mm. and it's, uh, doesn't last permanently, but it coats it in a thin layer of silver so you can overcome damage reduction by silver. I see. Okay. Or immunities in that case. Oh, okay. Uh, maybe I should look into picking some of that up if it's available. Uh, well, does your character know that silver hurts them? This is also true. I think I have to learn that in game. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, um, I, I might have reason to find that out soon. Anyway. So I, yeah. believe, I believe in prior editions of D&D, uh, lycanthropes and other creatures like that had damage reduction yeah. versus non-silver, for instance. So instead of doing, oh yeah, it's immune to all damage, it's like, okay, it's damage, damage reduction like 5 or maybe 10 uh, to any non-silvered attacks, mm. as an example. So you would subtract 10 damage total, or 5 damage total, to any attack that was made with a weapon or basically a weapon that was not silver or magic. Got it, got it. Yeah. But now they're immune to damage that's not silver or magic. Right. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll have to get into lycanthropes uh, on the next episode because that's a, that's a whole other kettle of fish that we're going to have to analyze. Um, but for purposes of this conversation, uh, yeah, immune to, immune to these damages, and that kind of puts several of the characters out of commission for dealing damage, uh, except, of course, for the few that actually had something akin to elemental powers. Now, I, I was looking at this thinking... Fire would probably be good. Rats typically don't like fire. I'm gonna guess a were-rat probably is still not fond of fire. Uh, that was my logic. But I only have one fire spell. And my one fire spell is Heat Metal. Yeah. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with Heat Metal, it is a, a very interesting spell, but it is a bit situational. Uh, the idea behind it is that a, uh, a constructed weapon that a manufactured weapon i should say that is made of metal you heat it up and it deals damage to the uh entity that is currently wielding it uh it can be like weapons or any it really supposed to be any kind of metal object or metal armor and so the first thing i ask is okay any of them wearing anything metal <laughs> yeah and it's like well no <laughs> they're in like no. leather armor um, they weren't even wearing armor that, yeah, so they got no armor for me to work with. I mean, when you're immune to all damage that's non-magical, non-silver, why, why would you even bother? bother? Yeah. <laughs> so the next thing I think to myself is, well, maybe I could target their weapons. Because they have, like, short swords, I think. Yeah. And uh, so, like, I go, okay, I'm gonna... I could cast Heat Metal on the, on the sword, and then they would take damage. And maybe they would drop their sword. That's also a possibility. Um, but then we had a bit of a confab because of a little technicality that, granted, I've thought about myself, which is, technically, where the monster is holding on to the short sword, or really anyone, is probably leather-bound, and therefore they're not really touching metal, yeah. so to speak. And, and it wasn't me going, yeah, that won't work, because I wanted to like, no. nerf your spell. It was one of the other players brought that up, and then yeah. I... As a group, we all kind of had discussion and decided that, yeah, it makes sense that leather would insulate that short sword, so you wouldn't really feel any of the heat. It's like wearing a leather grilling glove when you grab oh, sure. you know, something out of the grill. It's hot. It's not going to burn you. Right, exactly. Um, so we kind of we made that uh, ruling, 
And so then I was like, uh, yeah, I really want to be able to do something with this. And I think it was you who actually suggested, or somebody did, well, if that's the case, maybe we can use it on one of our team members' swords. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, maybe it would do fire damage. So the way that we rectified all of that was... Gwyn has has a sword, and uh, if I cast it on her sword, then she would have to like make the Constitution saving throws, and would take some fire damage, uh, mostly just to see if she holds on to it. And if you know, regardless though, as long as I'm concentrating on it, we could have the effect and the damage that would normally be done is added to the sword's hit value in fire damage. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm going to kind of, like, hand wave away the fact that the monsters wouldn't be affected by the heat, but Gwyn still was <laughs> technically affected by yeah, the Yeah, we, we... Listen, we weren't thinking all the way through on no. that. <laughs> but, but I kind of think, like, if we really look at it, you're, you're getting to add 2d8 to every one of your sword strikes, so... I, you know, and it's like more of a permanent effect, the way we were adding it. Instead of the instantaneous, it's on like a flash and out, which is how heat metal usually works. It's not a continuous effect. Um, I get that. I, I feel like in some ways I probably damaged Gwyn more than <laughs> than the monsters did. I think I did more damage to Gwyn than the monsters. A little bit. Um, little bit. I mean, in hindsight, if you had, you, if we had let you use it normally. Yeah. The were rats, I believe, still get their uh, probably a claw, and yeah. and their bite attack, so they don't really need their swords. Plus, they also had, I think, uh, like light crossbows or hand crossbows. Sure. Yeah. So like they could have just dropped their sword and just been like, "All right, guess I'm gonna use my teeth." <laughs> right. Um. I mean, I figured I'd, I'd at least get some good, like, straight damage on it because. The, the thing I do like about Heat Metal is that if it is in the right situation, it starts off as like a 2d8 fire damage spell that has no saves. And and it doesn't even have like a, uh, a spell ranged attack. You just do the damage. Right. You just do it. And then if they're holding on to the sword, if they keep holding on to the sword, or they have the armor on... Uh, you can keep doing that as a bonus action for the entire length of the concentration spell. So you get good right. damage you can use over yeah, a long Yeah, so if you're time. fighting someone with full plate... Oh, you devastate them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's well, especially because then you have to take into account... And this, this is, like, one of the few times I would actually take into account, like, the time it takes to take off and put on yeah. armor. Yeah. Because full plate is takes a while to put on. Yeah, yeah. And a while to take off. Even hastily, it takes a while to take full plate off. Now, a breastplate, sure, might take you around because you just kind of undo the buckles and throw it off, maybe. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it, it's, um, it, it's hard for them to actually take it off, and you'd think that you'd probably be able to reliably do it, and it would last for as long as concentration isn't broken. You get about 10 rounds out of it. Uh, and being able to use it as a bonus action is pretty great. The other thing that's really great about Heat Metal, though, is if they fail the Constitution saving throws, which I think is uh, is the, the other part of this, if they're wearing the object and take damage from it, they have to succeed on a Constitution saving throw and drop the object. And if they can't get away from the object, then they also get disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks until your next turn when you do it again. <laughs> so I just looked it up really quick too, by the way. Yeah. Uh, the time it takes to dawn and doff apparently is the word they're using in this case. Yeah. To get in and get out of different armor types. Light armor takes a minute to put on and a minute to take off. Got it. Generally speaking. Medium armor takes five minutes to put on. One minute to take off. Okay. So it's still easy to take it off. Guess what heavy armor is though? And in, oh, in this, God, it's got to take what almost a half hour to put on, or so. It it takes ten minutes to put it on, and it's five minutes to take off heavy oh, armor. Okay. You can reduce the time in half with help. Oh yeah. So even at 
the minimum of like getting someone to help you take off your heavy armor, which then takes another person out of commission yeah. during the combat. Yeah. Um, so if you use heat metal on someone on full plate, it would either take them five minutes to take the armor off mm -hmm. or two and a half minutes with help, but taking a second person. And that is, you know, 10, 20, 25 rounds of combat. Yeah, it's 25 like, rounds. They're not getting out of that before that spell ends in the time combat is actually taking. No. And if we do the math, uh, your duration is a concentration spell. It's up to one minute. So I've got this for like 10 rounds. And so it's 2d8 fire damage every single round <laughs> that I can do as bonus actions. And that's only one spell slot that I have to use. So after that ends, I just kind of go, well, screw it. I'll burn another second level spell slot for the next 10 rounds. <laughs> yeah. Why not? Because it's it ends up being 20d8 fire damage, basically. That's a okay. lot. 20d8 is a lot of damage. Oh, yeah. It sure is. I mean, is. It's, it's over... The entire course of combat, mind you, but yeah, it's free damage. It's yeah, I can be casting other spells as regular actions in the meantime, and then just like snap my fingers as a bonus action, and just yeah. like yep, more heat damage. <laughs> just keep going, and considering that you keep having to do saving throws, and there is no reduction of damage or anything like that, it's it's yeah. it's a very reliable spell. Yeah, uh, you're just lucky that the lycanthropes didn't have fire resistance too. Yeah, that would have been shame they weren't terrible. shame they weren't tiefling lycanthropes. Oh my god, yeah, that would have been uh, annoying, annoying indeed. Uh, so anyway, our workaround for that was just using it on uh, one of our party members' uh, swords, and I guess we did have to inadvertently really reinterpret the way the spell is supposed to be. Like, I don't know if it would be something I would suggest as a regular usage of the spell, because I think it it feels a little broken. Because <laughs> as a fighter who can get, like, action surge, Gwyn had one round where she was able to do, like, four straight attacks, and we were adding the 2d8 fire damage for each one which is good for us especially, <laughs> but does seem like in normal usage this would become kind of a problem, even if the fighter is taking some damage and potentially dropping the sword and have to pick it up, you know. Right. A, a, a very unreliable flaming sword attack. Um, now, uh, a, from the perspective of, of a GM, um, is this something that you would recommend having seen it in practice for somebody else who was trying to use the spell that well, way. Like, using it the way we used it? Yeah. I think if you have a situation like we did where there wasn't really an effective way to deal with the lycanthropes by most of the party, yeah, I think it's okay uh, to yeah. modify spells in weird ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I think doing that in general can be fun because, uh, you know, the rules are there as a guideline sure but like using spells in inventive ways is always fun like you talked about the, one of the times before making a maze oh yeah yeah for instance or uh, i've mentioned using my thorn whip as a way of traversal sure for my druid mm -hmm. i think that's fine because then it comes uh, it lets the players role play a bit sure and uh tinker with the mechanics in ways that they're not written specifically but ways that are within the rule set to let them work got it yeah you know i think it's fine especially if you're overcoming certain obstacles that may be difficult in ways that are creative so yeah and i i started to realize when i was looking at were rats uh because i was like oh these can't possibly lycanthropes really do get total resistance to all of these that's crazy uh i saw i saw comments on the act on D, D beyond where they were like that that particular quest in that particular module seemed to have tripped up a lot of game masters who had new players because it is very much a new player quest line um and they when they got to that part in the i spire peak um the, a lot of them wound up with some real problems a lot of players that just simply didn't have 
the means to effectively fight, and I get, I'm going to guess a lot of them weren't able to drive half of them away uh, at the start. Yeah, and I let you do that before I even looked at their stats and was like, oh shit, right, they have immunities. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things I had seen, they had some different workarounds, and we, we can talk sure. about that. One way you can deal with that, is. for instance, as a, as a GM, would be to say, instead of their immunities giving them resistance so they have half damage yeah it's one we can deal with that another would be if you if you pre-read these things the way i don't you could leave maybe in some of the other quests you've done leading up to it or at the beginning of the mine maybe some easily findable uh silvered weapons oh sure sure um, or some there should have been some like hints mm. or like something that's be like you know oh there's where there's lycanthropes in this forest or somewhere there have been lycanthropes or some information, you know, or maybe a note you found that's like, yeah, there are lycanthropes and, you know, they really don't seem to like silver. Yeah, or like you know? the the guy who uh, who led us to the mine, Don John, that guy, um, like he might have had information about like lycanthropes if he's dealt with, like he obviously didn't like them. So or or, he or know. here's an example that probably could have worked really well. Mm -hmm. You guys went to the mine, met the werats, and then they sent you to the the shrine to get rid of the orcs mm. and ogres. Well, why didn't the orcs and ogres have things that werats didn't like? Yeah, maybe the orcs and ogres should have had silver weapons mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. otherwise the werats really have no reason to be scared of them yeah yeah honestly um, unless there were some orc mages or something around that they were worried about but and, right so yeah. like maybe that should have been a thing where oh yeah they ask you to go do this to take care of them and while you're taking care of these orcs you find it kind of strange that all of them have some silvered weapons and maybe there's a note on one of them mm. talking about how like oh yeah the you know maybe it's just an orcish so you have to be able to read orcish sure um but maybe it says yeah we're got rid of the or a diary and true it's like we can <laughs> or starting diary yeah but yeah. maybe it's like oh we had to take care of these were rats uh they really didn't like our silver weapons like yeah. you know something like that yeah so then you could have looted them taken their silver weapons and then gone back and once the were rats were like oh yeah we're not fucking leaving you could have been like oh cool well how about this fucking silver sword and they were like yeah, that would have been a problem. I do like the idea of orcs just writing in their diaries. You know, just, Dear diary. Today I raided a camp, beheaded a couple farmers. Things went well. Perfect. <laughs> Start living my best life. Uh, but <laughs> there, there's that. Or actually the thing that we ended up doing is we kind of turned the torches into almost like a simple weapon. Yeah. and uh, allowed them to do, like, 1d4 fire damage, and, you know... I, I let them do more damage than they should have done. Yeah, I think technically so that, they do one damage. One yeah, I didn't damage. really want the combat to drag out for another hour. Yeah, yeah. And then inevitably, when I was like, well, I'll just see if they can take psychic damage, and I just uh, vicious mockery to cover <laughs> one or two of them. It's like, yeah, that works. That also works. Let's do yeah. that. Um, I guess I figured that they were at least not immune to spells because I was able to use sleep. So I figured, well, maybe they'll take damage from some other sources, but, um, so. Uh, anyway, creative use of heat metal, uh, not necessarily something I would recommend. I imagine the way that it's written is that even if there is a leather handle, it's technically a manufactured metal object. You yeah. probably most I think most people would assume that it would work on it since it's a, a manufactured object itself. But hey, I think it made for a much more interesting encounter doing yes. it the way we did. So definitely. Uh, <laughs> so uh, everyone out there, if you have used a spell, maybe it was heat metal, maybe it was something else in a role playing game in an interesting way that is probably unorthodox for the rules as written please let us know uh, i'm curious as to the creative uh, means by which everybody goes about mm, making the spells their own 
so to yes. speak. Up next on the show, we have a soapbox, and the uh, subject of the soapbox is that uh, mobile games might be lucrative, but that doesn't make them good. Um, <laughs> recently, I uh, had seen an article that was actually about Call of Duty Mobile. You might have heard of that, Alex. And, uh, Once or twice. Yeah. Uh, originally released in 2019, and earlier this year, they had posted that since its launch, it had made... 1.5 billion with a B dollars in microtransaction sales. Boy, that's a lot of money. It's a lot of money considering that it's only been out for a few years. Uh, that's 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 a good chunk of change. Um, of course, the more recent mobile debacle of sorts has been Diablo Immortal, which has still, in the first two weeks that it was out reportedly made something along the lines of 24 million dollars a nice chunk of change for first couple weeks oh you know? yeah yeah i mean yeah for a free to play game uh, i won't uh i wouldn't snub that i wouldn't snub that ultimately this is the reason why mobile games are such a large section of the gaming market now is just because they make a lot of money even if the games are technically free yeah and um that's that's great they are indeed lucrative but i wanted to make it clear that that does not in any way make them good as games uh i don't know how many mobile games you have tried or played or i don't yeah it's probably the smart thing to do. I don't... The, the last mobile game I played on my phone was Pokemon Go. Yeah. And technically it's still installed on my phone, but I haven't played it in, like, over two years, three years. I have not played it for a while. It's just in fits and spurts, and usually when, like, the, uh, the nieces come over, they want to catch Pokemon or something. Uh, 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 but, you know, not that Pokemon Go has also made a near fortune... <laughs> since its launch uh and and that's that's great the thing about it is though i would really love it if you know the mobile games could match the amount of money that they make with actually creating a good gaming experience uh and and i mean maybe that's just not the kind of market that they're aiming for i i yeah. guess they kind of figure that the like the hardcore gamer kind of group, or even just like the long-term gamers that are used to consoles or PC, might not be playing the same games that a mobile gamer are going to be playing. Not necessarily. Probably so. not. If mobile, mobile games tend to be more of a casual um, market. Yeah. Typically. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is the uh, I, that's the reason why they uh, had Diablo Immortal. Uh, becoming the mobile game that it was because y'all have phones, right? And, um, But now, see, they did one thing that some folks... Uh, Josh Strife was talking about this on one of his uh, shows, that it might have actually been a mistake to also release it on the PC. Because that's ultimately what they did. They made right. a PC version. Still free, technically but a PC version. And what that lends itself to is now there's this market that's used to the PC versions of Diablo that they've played for, you know, decades now, that is going to be comparing it directly where the mobile gaming market may not have. So I did play Diablo Immortal a bit. Uh, so, and I've played now, as I like look back on it, every Diablo game. How unfortunate. Yeah, I know. Well, there are highs and lows in this yeah. in this thing. Uh, there will be an upcoming uh, Citanium Mine about that as well. But uh, in general, what happens is that then I have to compare Immortal to other Diablo games. Because you're used to the lore and you're used to the characters. I mean, the character classes themselves that you can play are, are very close to the uh, classes that you could play in Diablo 3. Yeah, you know, there's there's a necromancer and there's a uh, what is there? There's the um, demon slayer and there's a barbarian. You know, the classics. Classics. Yeah, classics. Uh, there's like a paladin too. They like brought the paladin back for this. Good for them. Oh, and good. A, a wizard. Can, yeah. yeah. The paladin was always fun in Diablo too. It is. 
Yeah, uh, and I think the wizard was the like the spell casty class specifically. Yeah, that they sorcerer, that. wizard, whatever. So yeah, they change it up a little bit. But anyway, a lot of the classics coming back. Um, when I first got into it, though, I started to realize that there were a few problems. One, it definitely is built for mobile. Like PC was an afterthought. The way it's laid out, the limited number of abilities that you can actually key on. Um, the floatiness of using an uh, like a controller, uh, it, it's it's if you want to do like a directional spell and you're using the controller, they want you to like hold down a button and then use your uh, thumbstick to direct it and then release the buttons in order yeah. to to do it. It's just not very useful. I found myself going back to the mouse and keyboard because I've it's played there. some twin stick shooters that do that for abilities it, it can be okay yeah but it's not generally my preferred style of playing those games yeah and um i found it very difficult to actually uh implement while i was playing ultimately i went back to the keyboard and the mouse and it, it felt felt a little bit better um you're just basically at that point pointing and clicking to where you want to go or what you want to smite uh yeah I thought I was going to have a little bit of fun. I was still playing the Necromancer, and that should automatically make this a win. Um, I found it a little bit odd that I could only have, like, two skeletons at the outset, and there wasn't, like, a an upgrading tree for that ability. And this kind of came into the whole having to streamline things because it's a mobile game, uh, essentially where they didn't want to get too deep into the weeds with character design or development. And as you level up, which happens very, very fast, especially at the beginning, um, you're just, you're just like automatically unlocking spells and abilities and upgrades without even really having time to process that you're doing it. Uh, I was like, in the first 15 minutes, I was level like seven, <laughs> I think. And I went in, and it's like, I don't even know what I got for those seven levels, really. I guess I unlocked some spells. And so I looked, and yeah, you've unlocked a couple spells. You wanted to hotkey them. And also, oh, this, this thing that you had where you raised the dead, that's now, like, level four. How to get to level four? I don't even know what that does. Is it good? Maybe. Um, just in general, a very bare-bones experience uh, that didn't feel very customized. And uh, mostly just the, the go to this place, kill this thing, go back to town, tell the quest giver that you killed it, and now we're going to take you to the next place. And you can even auto-run from one location to another if you want to avoid it. Uh, in the meantime, there's a bunch of other people running around also doing quests. Uh, I don't know if you can do it as a single-player experience. I didn't see the options for it, so... Yeah, I, don't you love the idea of just running around and just other people are smiting in the meantime? <laughs> the no. Yeah. Um, so, uh, the problem, of course, becomes that I have to then look at it in terms of what it was doing compared to other Diablo games. And other Diablo games have a much more interesting design development and personal experience. And even, you know, a multiplayer experience where you can team up and, and do all of that. And so, felt kind of flat. Visuals, fine, good, and everything like that. But I think maybe just because of the nature of mobile games having to lend themselves to a more simplistic framework, they had to really reduce down the gaming experience to a very bare-bones level. Um, and, and I didn't really appreciate that. Um, luckily, I didn't get too much into the, the loot boxes and anything like that. Um, it does become pretty prevalent. They offer, like, a, a, like, for just a dollar, you can get this starter pack, you know, the, the way they hook you in. Uh, I did not take that offer, but it, it did come in in probably the first hour. Of uh, course, I, I heard it was very predatory with its monetization, so. And it, it makes it very clear right up at the front. Um, yeah. There's been some auto rollers where they were trying to predict how much it was going to cost. And yeah, it, it will probably cost you thousands uh, on average if you want to get like a five star gem. There have been some people that literally paid $25,000 to get like a five star gem. And for the record, you're the problem. <laughs> uh, sorry. 
you're the problem. Um, you're the reason they keep making these. Uh, so I guess my upshot to all of this is I just want, you know, I don't mind having a mobile market. I understand the reason why. I understand that it makes a lot of money, but my god, folks, can you use some of that money to make a better game? Can right. you just use it to make a better gaming experience? If you got $24 million in the first two weeks, make something with that. <laughs> Do something well, you, with it. Here, here's the issue. If you can make a mobile game that makes that much money, what's the point of making good games if all you're doing is making money? There, therein lies the real issue, isn't there? Like, they're going to just keep making those games and they're not going to make the actual, like, AAA or high quality games or the, you know, the ones that actually take a lot of time because they're not going to rake in that kind of money. Um, it's been a problem that we've been seeing and the reason why microtransactions get into even the full tier, like, you know, the, the console or the PC gaming as well. It started to infest those areas too because it makes a ton of money. It, I don't I don't necessarily mind the game companies making money, but I'd like to think that the money that they're making on it would go toward building the game up, you know? Keep the developers working on it. Like just like keep them expanding the the way the game works and the features that it has and something like that. Now I have kind of heard that a lot of what they were doing with Diablo Immortal was so that they could have the money and the time so that they could make Diablo 4. Um, I'm a little shaky on that. I, I keep thinking that what they're really trying to do is see if the model for Diablo Immortal, where they're going to charge a bunch of money and have those different uh, microtransactions and premium currencies, is a test run to see if they want to do it in Diablo 4. Yeah, I feel like, though, if they do that in Diablo 4, where it's probably going to be a console and PC release and not a mobile game, the market's very different. The market is going to be very different, and I, they're, they're still not going to make it... A, that's not going to be a free game. That They're going to charge money for it at the front. Right. It's going to be a full release, full price game, I'm sure. Uh, so it's going to be a harder sell to say, oh yeah, but we also actually carved out most of the fun parts of the game so that we could sell it back to you later. Um, and the thing that I've noticed in recent days, too, is that after Diablo Immortal didn't work out for me, I sat there and said, oh, well, there's a bunch of things on Steam that are on sale that are Diablo, you know, Diablo-esques, Diablo-likes. <laughs> The other hack and slash games, and recently I've been playing a few of them, and uh, and realizing okay these are much less expensive than the thousands of dollars you have to pay to get a freaking gem. <laughs> uh, they're they're not nearly as as uh, expensive, and they probably came out a very long time ago. And I'm realizing that for you know pound for pound, better overall gaming experiences that offer more content than yeah. even the new Immortal. I mean, that's one of the reasons why one of the games that I've been playing recently again has been Warhammer 40k Inquisitor Martyr. Oh, yeah. yeah. Which I mentioned to you earlier. It's yeah. because it's kind of Diablo 2 in space with guns in Warhammer, which are all things I like. Yeah, exactly. Granted, I wish they did the Diablo 3 route of having an adventure mode that you can skip the story mode. Because oh, after yeah. the first twice... Because there's two different morality routes you can do for, like, your alignment, essentially. Either, you know, like, radical or puritan. Which is very in theme with Warhammer, but after the first two times doing the storyline in one of those ways, it doesn't really warrant me going through the whole story again. Yeah. yeah exactly. But they do have seasons now. You can, the story is just the quickest way to get experience sure level so i've been churning that out yeah and but hey, still enjoying it the yeah. season's good yeah i mean i played a bit of uh inquisitor martyr 2 i have it and uh i was like i like the framework i like kind of like the run and gun kind of action and it's uh, probably gotten better since you played it although my friend who worked at the studio is no longer working there because he found a better company work for <laughs> fair but he did he did help solve a lot of the balance issues uh and make the game better 
Sure. So hopefully it's better than when you last played it, if you ever want to try it again. Yeah, maybe I'll go back. Maybe it won't be... Uh, hopefully they've done some optimization, because it took a long time to get into the, the game. Well, you've also gotten a new computer. I have gotten a new computer. I, well, I was playing it on Xbox. I wonder if the Xbox version oh. is a... Uh, you know. um, just play it on computer. <laughs> I'll have to buy it again, probably. Uh, it goes on sale frequently for cheap. Okay, good. Uh, however, the ones that I did end up buying, I haven't gotten that one. Uh, there was one that I got that was just a little indie game that I think was made by, like, two people. But it was called Rum and Gun. And it's literally a pirate-themed, like, hack-and-slash top-down ARPG. Perfect. You, you get a blunderbuss, you get a sword, and, and you even get a fiddle so that you can do what will we do with a drunken sailor to, like, regenerate your hit points and stuff like that. And you're... You're dealing with giant crabs and stuff. I was like, this, this is kind of cute. This is kind of fun, actually. Um, but uh, more recently, though, I had also gotten uh, Grim Dawn, which I haven't gotten around to playing yet. Uh, I have Grim Dawn. Yeah, yeah, I um, had, I'd seen that. Yeah. I, it's, it's a game I would like to like, but it's not... I don't find it very engaging. Yeah. Like, the gameplay is, is fine, I played 72 hours of it. The gameplay oh, okay. is fine. The story is is does not draw me in at all. The lore means nothing to me. Sure. So it's not I I can't invest into it. I get you. Despite the 72 hours, it's like I'm not I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. It's like what's the story? Where am I supposed to go? Why does any of this matter? I'm just it's, I go into murder things once in a while. Sure. The systems are okay. They're neat. Yeah. Um but yeah, it's it's. I, uh, I I wanted to try it because it is one of the more generally more recent Diablo kind of games that have come out. Because I think it's twenty six. I think you'll think you'll enjoy the systems and the subsystems. Good. I think you'll probably think the same as me. The story, maybe I don't know. Sure. You'll probably enjoy the the class system though and the skill system. Okay. Um, the other one, though, that I have actually been playing the last couple days is Titan Quest. And, um, you know, I had tried that briefly, uh, once upon a time, uh, but I really liked it, and I did get, uh, the, I think it's the Ragnarok and the Atlantis expansions? And the, the neat thing about that is, you know, that starts you off pretty bare bones. You don't really have a class at the beginning, and then you choose masteries that you can can lay on top of that after you've started um but uh yeah it's it's neat just from a general setting i think it's from the same people that created like age of empires and age of mythology ah, uh, you. but uh you know something where you can actually fight you know mythic creatures and eventually fight gods through like greece and egypt and all the gods are tight some are the titans and i think some are like demigods and stuff like oh, that perfect uh but i think typhon and in in uh atlantis i think there's actually a tiamat is even one of the bosses uh that you fight so they've got some interesting interesting characters that come into that i think uh sharon uh medusa you know there's there's a lot of mythological creatures and i like that kind of setting anyway so, uh, right now I think I'm just at the Battle of Athens, which is great. Um, of course, they also have mods for that one. Some of them are pretty neat. Uh, and, uh, some of them will let you just play as some of the Titans. <laughs> so, that's, that's fun if you ever just wanted to be Typhon and just smash around. They got you covered. Uh, <laughs> but at any rate, when I can buy those games for, like, six bucks or seven bucks and it would pro I probably wouldn't even get a decent gem for that kind of money or buy the kind of premium currency as I might want in a Diablo Immortal I, I don't really think that the PC launch has really helped because I think it opened them up for far more criticism than anything else yeah yeah, yeah definitely if it was just on mobile uh, most like gaming news outlets probably wouldn't have, have spent much time picking it apart uh but uh, maybe it's a good thing that they did, though, uh, because it's good that we know <laughs> that streamers were able to look at it and uh, pick it apart and see exactly how predatory the, the marketing is. 
Yeah. Um, but I think we just kind of bog ourselves down in that and don't talk about the fact that the game itself is not very good by comparison. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, I get it. It's lucrative, guys. But come on. Make a better game with that money. <laughs> Seriously. Last up on our list is a one more thing, Alex. One one more. Just one. There's one only thing. one more yeah, thing. And then it's over. Uh, so we're going to try something kind of fun. And I say kind of fun because uh, the first time we tried this, I thought it worked out okay. Uh, but uh, we're going to try it again and see if we have as much luck as the first time. Uh, anyway, let me just kind of give everybody the concept. We're going to do something I am calling... That was a weird way of me saying it. We're going to do something that I'm calling side quest storming. And basically what we're going to do is uh, we're going to look at a list of quest ideas for tabletop gaming. There's a lot of these online. A lot of these. Uh, and uh, luckily I found one. This one that we're looking at right now is going to be from mysticwaffle.com. That's specifically D&D quest ideas. They have been so nice as to actually number them. So I'm yes, happy about 1 that. 1 to 32. Minus a couple we probably won't read because they're too fucking long. They, some of them are a little long. Uh, the idea is that we're going to pick a character that we play. Uh, we are going to uh, roll some magic dies. Mine is actually this new one that I got here. Yeah, mine is virtual. Yours is virtual, and we are going to pick uh, three quests for uh, the other person's character to kind of see what they would do, just as a general quick and dirty way of dealing with whatever that scenario would be, based on the characters that they are. Um, I am going to be using Snowball the Rainbow Unicorn, Detective. Uh, Alex, who do you want to use? Uh, I'm, I'm going to go, this time, last time, since we're re-recording, I went with Baylock. I'm going to sure. go with Hef. Hefaestus, okay. Because he's actually someone that's played way more than Baylock, even though it's the same campaign. So. Hefaestus is a uh, dragonborn druid? Hefaestus is a dragonborn, dragonborn druid, uh, and he is also a were-tiger. He is also a wear tiger. Well, that gives you a few options. <laughs> uh, Snowball, as people might know, is technically, by D and D rules, the way I've played him, a uh, rogue inquisitive, uh, and um, he actually uses the half elf model for stats. So he's he's got a, he's got a little bit of haughtiness and uh, <laughs> and a little bit of feyish kind of magic to him. Perfect. But uh, anyway, so. Do you want to give me my first uh, sure. encounter? I rolled a 17 for you, Nathan. So, okay. Snowball. Yes. A local dragon is devastating the countryside, but after defeating it, Snowball wakes up. Uh, sorry, Snowball awakens in the local inn to find it was all a dream. Or was it? You know, actually, this is a great one for Snowball. Because Snowball's a detective. Like, oh, yeah. like, uh, like, literally, uh, like everything that I can do is is observation based. If you were to look at his character sheet, his like passive perception and insight are like twenty five and twenty seven. <laughs> he's he's very observant. He's very good at that. Um, I I think that the first thing is so he was waking up in the local inn. First of all, he'd probably wonder if they put him in the barn or in one of the rooms. But after he discerns <laughs> determines that, uh, he'll probably go out and look for signs of uh, dragons. His first thoughts would be to see if there are scales, uh, claw marks, or possibly I don't know, people with singed eyebrows. I think that that would be one of the first things he'd want to sure. <laughs> he'd want to check. Um, and uh, mostly like. If, if it turns out that the there isn't an actual local dragon, if he discerns that it is all in his head, why is he dreaming of dragons? What What is causing him to dream of dragons? Is there somebody that has put a dream curse on him so that he's scared of dragons all the time? I, I, he'd have to wonder about that, because I don't think Snowball would... Snowball is traditionally very bad in fights. 
He is not a fighter. He is a utilitarian kind of character. He's there to investigate and solve pro like problems and puzzles and talk to people. Uh, so dealing with the dragon, not going to be a lot of fun. But uh, yeah, he's interrogating everybody in the town. He's finding out if somebody knows about this dragon, if somebody's controlling this dragon. And uh, then if it turns out that the dragon's real... Uh, well, he'd probably just have a bunch of the peasants go and try to fight the dragon while he skips out of town real quick. I mean, I think it was that the dragon was defeated. Oh, is that after defeating it, the characters awaken? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, I get you. After defeating it, the characters awaken and find that it was all a dream. Well, you never know. There might be more dragons. Where there's one dragon, there might be more. There's, where there's one dragon, there's a brood. There's a brood. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, okay, so if they have actually defeated the the dragon, I definitely want to find out where his gold is. Yeah, why why did I fall asleep and not loot its den? Only to find out that somebody got... One of the other people that isn't here already betrayed me, and now I gotta find... <laughs> no, I, I'd be uh, probably looking for the gold if there is no actual dragon left to find. It was just a cracker dragon, it just hoarded crackers. It hoarded crackers. <laughs> it's it's the saltine crack <laughs> dude, <Yes>. dragon. <laughs> All right, <laughs> let me see if I can give you one here. Hephaestus. Oh, hey, eighteen. We're right there anyway. Um, okay, Heph. The town's water supply has been poisoned, and people everywhere are deathly sick. It'll take some serious detective work to follow the clues. But what they uncover is an intricate plot to assassinate a noble family. Uh, see, this is this is also a good one for Hef, because Hef is a druid, and I believe yeah. one of the spells he gets is purify yeah. uh, food and water and detect poison and disease. Mm. Um, so Hef is uniquely, not uniquely, but Hef is pretty well suited for this, actually. Like, he could definitely go ahead and purify the water supply, mm. uh, and detect poison, and as a shapeshifter, he could potentially see if anyone sneaks in at night to tamper with it, and then stalk them. Yeah. Any, in any animal form he really wants to at that point, probably an owl or something quiet. Sure. Um, so, Hef could, uh, serious investigation, well, he's not really an investigator like Snowball, but he is kind of clever and sneaky sometimes when he has to be. Sure. Um, so he would definitely be like, oh, well, this is, I don't really care for towns that much, but, you know, don't contaminate nature. No. So he might not care about the plot on the assassin, uh, to, on the assassination attempt, but, uh, he still might be like, yeah, I don't care that you're trying to assassinate the nobles. I care that you're tampering with the water supply and animals are dying. Yeah, that's you know, his that's, priority. Yeah, that's that's his priority. Yeah. So I think he would he would exact justice on tampering with nature more so than you know human things. Sure, sure. You know civilized society things. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that that would be fun. He'd be like, yeah, I don't. You, oh, you're here about the assassination attempt. It's like, what? No, what, what assassination attempt? You you poison the water and you killed my bear. <laughs> <laughs> kill a bear <laughs> like you killed my food supply and now I'm c coming to hunt you yeah that's what I do exactly although Hef also as a lycanthrope probably pretty well suited to hunting things as well yeah so you know but hey if uh, if you can't hunt your game you hunt the polluters <laughs> that poison the water supply yeah. <laughs> they taste good too yeah, yeah. I mean, Hef has been known to eat humanoids once in a great while. Yeah, you know. Well, well, in animal form, mind you. Oh, thanks for the clarification. I yeah, not in that. his dragonborn form. Oh. That's just not okay. Yeah, that's uh, that wouldn't be kosher. But know. when you're hungry. Oh yeah, when you're when you're hungry, everything looks like a bear. No, when you're hungry, anything looks so like yummy. That's true. All right, next up for Nathan. Yes. 28. Let's see what 28 is. Okay. Mm. Oh, it's not a long one. The city guard of a port... I feel like... 
We Thank dealt you. with this one last. I got you got you this got one last this time. Last time, okay, yeah, yeah. The city guard of Port Town hires the characters to deal with a shark problem. The local f fishermen and t travelers yeah. have been getting eaten by a monster, bloodthirsty shark. The characters are going to need a boat. Yeah, I I remember this. I was like, oh great, snowballs in Jaws now. Uh, but, but um, snow snowball. <laughs> Snowball. Uh, as I think I explained in the last one, Snowball's big priority is that he is not going to fight a shark. Uh, he's just not going to do that. That is off Maybe the table. Maybe he can jump the shark with the boat. Uh, I mean, Snowball, by his very character, is very good at jumping sharks. Uh, I think that we've pretty much established that. But um, he's, he's not going to get the boat. He's not going to get the shark. Uh, he's going to probably uh, assume that uh, the fishermen, if rallied correctly, will maybe go and take care of the shark. But as an investigator, his main uh, question is why the shark happens to be attacking this particular port town. And if there is something that is drawing the shark there. If there is something that is drawing or someone that is specifically drawing the shark there. At which point he's investigating that from the safety of the shore... And not in the water at all. <laughs> he's going specifically onto the shoreline, and he's going to see if there's actually a reason why the shark is getting specifically drawn to that port town. At which point, he's dealing more with the actual source of the of that problem than anything else. It's sort of like, if you remember, if you played Knights of the Old Republic, there was a part on the planet Manan where there was like this giant Firaxis shark that was under the waves and it was causing a lot of problems and you could repair or destroy like this tank underneath and if you repaired it it made the shark not angry anymore uh, or you could destroy it and kill the shark in the meantime basically Snowball's looking for the tank in this scenario not the go. shark yeah not Deal the shark tank yeah, not the Shark Tank. TV You're, show. Yeah, we're uh, <laughs> we're traversing it as much as possible. Um, fun fact: in England, before it was Shark Tank in the U.S., it was Dragon's Den. Yes. So hey, that that fits on theme. Okay, let me get you one here. Let me get you one. Ooh, five. Way the hell up here. Oh boy. All right, Hef, Bounty Hunt. The characters are hired to track down and bring in a notorious gang of thieves hiding out in the nearby forest. Perfect. Great. Another perfect one for Hef. He has to hunt thieves in a forest. First yeah. of all, he loves forests. Second of all, he can talk to animals. He prefers not to. He doesn't like to talk to animals, but he will occasionally... Um, the reasoning for this is he does not talk to his food. Right. <laughs> he he only eats meat if he's part at least helped hunt it. Yes. Otherwise, he's a vegetarian. Mm. As a druid, one who also turns into animals, he respects animals, but he will eat them if he has hunted them. Fair enough. Otherwise, you won't eat anyone else's meat. Like, don't all, like, the reason he had eaten a guard once is because he'd been in jail for, like, a week and was a little hungry and couldn't go hunting. Yeah. So after he killed all the guards, a as a bear, he decided to eat an arm. Good. He's like, ah, protein. Um, Yummy. <laughs> so, Hef, oh man, again, Wild Shape is really great if you really wanted to. Mm. Um depending on when in his life this is, you know, he could always just go lycanthrope, wear tiger, and stalk the entire one, uh, you know, band of thieves. Pick him off. And get, no, it said, the, I believe it says, you're, uh, oh, you're bringing him in. Bring him out of hiding. Yeah, he could probably terrify them as a wear tiger into leaving the forest of their own volition. Mm -hmm. uh, as well as creating the rumors that there is a scary uh, lunar lynx, as it were, an albino were-tiger in the forest stalking creatures. Oh, sure. Because he uh, 
wasn't just a were tiger it was a, a special breed from his home islands that we figured out was called the lunar lynx uh it was an albino were tiger oh interesting from his from his ancestral home yeah uh, that he got uh contracted it from it got it got kind it. of a mark of honor on his island kind of not kind of like a curse at the same time Oh, sure. Um, sure. But it also was what we used to explain how, why he was so good at shape-shifting. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I feel like Hef would uh, wait until a nice, like, full moon. And uh, he had full control of his lycanthropy at that point in general. Okay. So he would probably use the full moon and scare those thieves into the waiting arms of the town guards. He'd probably be like, hey, so I'll go get the the thieves for you. Mm. Um, just uh, don't listen to any stories they tell you. It's all going to be glitz and glamour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't listen to them. I'm not really a lycanthrope. Don't worry. <laughs> don't e worry. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Nothing to see I can here. imagine. I can imagine him stalking them out of their hiding place uh, in the woods pretty effectively. Because he could go between tiger, were tiger, hybrid form, and then his animal shape shifting yeah. to like make it seem like there's more than one of him mm -hmm. in different locations pretty quickly. Oh yeah, so, yeah. you know, you know, it's good stuff. Yes. And generally, other druid spells that can just turn the nature against the thieves. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty handy that it happens to be in a forest. Yeah, yeah, it is. It it's really pretty. Is. Mm hmm. Excellent. All right. So, what do you got for me? Ah, uh, let's see. I got well, one more. Uh, yes. I got eight. A sprite approaches Snowball, pleading for help. Oh, no. The forest home of her people is being clear cut by a massive army. Will the players help her turn the army away and save the forest creatures? No. Right. Okay. okay. <laughs> no, no. Gets first gets this is this is this is where Snowball's kind of like going. Oh no, not this stuff again. Not sprites. I don't have good luck with sprites. Um, actually, it was uh, it was Rembrandt that didn't have luck with sprites. Uh, Snowball, though, being from a glade and being a magical creature, probably still wouldn't be very happy with sprites. Um. I guess the, the first question Snowball has is what's in it for him? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and is this technically a situation where he could justify the sprite being one of his clients for the, for the agency? Oh, maybe, yeah. If, if, it's, if it's technically a... Like, he doesn't always like his assignments, but he'll usually do the assignments if it's, if it's actually for the Hoof and Horn Detective Agency. So if the sprite approaches, like the agency themselves then i guess i guess i'm duty bound to deal with it uh all right so reluctantly snowball would have to agree at that point and uh go into the forest uh find that it's being clear cut by an army and then try to bribe the company <laughs> i'm gonna find I'm going to find blackmail material on the company, figure out why they wanted to clear this forest, and uh, try to convince them that, uh, A, it would be in their best interest to not do that anymore, <laughs> and B, if they try it any further, I am totally going to uh, ruin them with the information that I find. It's basically right. digging up dirt with the guys at the top to make them stop doing stuff. Uh, and then, of course, get my reward from the sprite. Which and to go into hiding because an entire army is after you. Right. If at some point I had to, you know, stab a few people with my horn, so be it. But uh, I'm probably not going to be taking on a whole army. That doesn't seem like it's going to end well. <laughs> um, probably not. Uh, and again, that's why blackmail behind the scenes. You don't want it to go public. Don't let it go public. And then... Have a magical have have like an owl that needs to hear from me every week, or it releases the documentation yeah, down to the local lords. Yeah, exactly. Blackmail them against the local lords, or try to get the local lords on your side and persuade them to uh, that it would be in their best interest 
to stop the uh, the army from clear cutting the forest. Perfect. Yeah. Um, and that is going to lead us to your final pick for Hef. Uh, let's see what we got. Uh, we have a... Oh, that's the one that we just did. I got a five well, again. Yeah, roll a different one. Okay. Okay, we got a, a two. Okay, a two. here. This is good. Traveling in the mountains, some unstable ground collapses, and the adventurers, Hef, fall into an abandoned mine shaft. They must find their way out. Well, it, it, since we're just doing this as if it's just our one characters, I mean, Hef can just turn into something with a burrow speed. That would be helpful, wouldn't it? <laughs> or a bat. A bat would be great. With, with echolocation and just... Hef would be able to find his way out pretty easily, given he knows where True North is and direction sense is pretty good because he has his cantrips for that and the ability to turn to animals to get out of situations that might be hard without sure you know let's say you fell down a 50 foot mine shaft and doesn't have a 50 foot ladder and can't climb it because it's sheer sides um he could fly out of it sure he could he could turn to something with a crawl like wall climb a spider a spider anything else like that he could burrow out of it Hef is here. Here's the thing: trapping a druid, not so easy. Yeah. Um, yeah. especially shapeshifting druid, because I could, you know, mold earth. Yep. I could turn into a different animal. There's a lot of different ways Hef could get out of a situation of falling into an abandoned mine shaft. Yeah. Like. Is he going to explore it? That's the question. Maybe? Though. Yeah. Probably not. I don't think he cares. He doesn't wonder but, like, why he fell into a mine shaft? No, I mean, unstable ground. Oh, the humans or, you know, the dwarves have been here. Shucks. It's like, it's abandoned for a reason. I'm not sticking around. He's he's had issues with holes in the ground with monsters in them before. He's getting out of there. Yeah. Um. There was a giant spider at the beginning of the campaign that the you know first time the other uh, the orc fell into it it was like mm. oh you okay it's like oh there's a big spider down here or something like that it's like oh and i was like hey how much is a bear weigh yeah and David was like uh eight or nine hundred pounds why i'm like i'm gonna jump in the hole and turn into a black bear yeah <laughs> or a brown bear yeah and so that's where the legendary drop bear came from. The drop bear in That was the first time. It was like our first session. Oh. First or second session. And I just jumped into the hole and the half orc moved to the side and I squished a spider. Perfect. Yeah, it's like you don't really need to do damage fighting it if you can just crush it underneath se several hundred pounds of bear. Yeah, exactly. It was it was pretty gross, but yeah. So uh, he probably wouldn't want to stick around. He's like, I've been here before. I'm getting the fuck out of here. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it, I'll, I'll tell you, if I was running a game and that was the first session, I would be very scared as to what the rest of the campaign would be like. <laughs> Listen, we had a lot of fun in that campaign. Oh, there are reasons I'm a werewolf or a were tiger. Oh yeah. And there are other reasons that I had to get resurrected from the dead. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. fighting demons that you have no chance of fighting because you realize that it's an ancestral enemy of your homeland. Uh, and you recognize it from legends. And you're like, yeah, no, I'm like duty bound to try and kill this thing. Because yeah. it's an affront to both nature and my home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then it just murders you. Because yep. you are not equipped to fight that on your own. It no, no, um, yeah, yeah. Out of care, out of character, you know, you're not equipped for it. In character, you're like, well, I guess it's what I do. I'm like, I am bound by like my druidic oaths to fight this evil, and I'm gonna fucking do it. And if I die, I die doing what I loved. You die, yeah, <laughs> trying to tear people in. Uh, tear, tear into people. With it was a really big demon. Yeah. That was murdering things. That's never good. Yeah, no, I I did not. 
do anything. Well, you have to assume that uh, any campaign where your character has has gotten out of it unscathed wasn't a very interesting campaign. Yeah, true. Yeah. True. Uh, anywho, uh, that has been side quest storming. And uh, if you are listening to this and you like this as a concept, let us know. I found many lists that are like this, that are not necessarily even D&D related. Uh, And uh, hey, we might try this again, uh, maybe with characters that aren't even D&D characters. We'll see. But you like it or you want to try it at home, feel free. I will make sure to leave a link to the list that we were using in the episode description. All right. So, uh, Deja Vu has been completed. Uh, we have recorded again this episode. Uh, I think it went better the second time, honestly, so good. Probably minus some interruptions. M- minus the interruptions and the technical problems that we had this time um, <laughs> with, with uh, Discord, I think it went pretty darn good. Uh, Alex, if, uh, the folks out there want to have Deja Vu related to our show, where could they go? Uh, if you want Deja Vu, listen to this episode again, and then go to TotalBellMockdown.com. That's right, and hey, you might even listen to other episodes that might even sound similar to ours, (laughs) to this episode right here. We have nearly 40 of them now. Uh, you can also listen to Citanium Mine over there and check out Creatures, and you can click on our Patreon banner if you would like to get additional content, including some of the bonus stuff that doesn't make it into the episode. Check us out on every podcast app known to mankind, including Anchor, where we are kind of, uh, that's kind of our home uh, platform. You can even leave voice messages for us over there if you have questions for the show. And you can find us on social media. I am at Citanium. I am at EXP Limited, and the show is over at Pebble Knockdown. And uh, feel free to contact us there with any of your questions, queries, or comments. Any of those things that start with k- any of those k- sound things uh, might start with Q, might start with a C or a K, whatever ones you want to do. Uh, and and until next time, Alex. Um, what were we doing here? I forget. Deja who? Exactly. Deja who? Deja you. Thank you for listening, Deja you, to our episode. And we will see you on the next one, which might still be this one. We'll find out. Bye for now. Bye.